Yes, my friends, this is Salazar, a.k.a. Daxion Amorti from TLook.com. In today's program, we're going to be tackling a very interesting topic in philosophy, namely the topic of ethics and specifically evolutionary ethics. I will be trying to defend the position that evolutionary ethics is basically false and, uh, at best, totally useless in the broader morality debate uh, be simply because it is a descriptive rather than prescriptive uh, theory of ethics. So let's start to tackle it, shall we? So welcome ladies and gentlemen to the DAC report on philosophy. Now, uh, we're gonna try to tackle um, the question of answering theist questions about uh, how can we have a objective morality, how can we derive what we ought to do, what is right, what is wrong, without God. So, let's start. And while I'm not on the subject of atheists debating the possibility of moral value without God, without a sufficient understanding of their subject matter, I should add a word about those who think that we have an evolved set of moral dispositions. One thing I expect any atheist who steps into the debate ring with a theist to discuss the issue of morality to know is the Eutifro dilemma. This was Plato's argument, attributed to Socrates, that is thought to destroy any possibility that morality comes from God. In the dialogue called Eutifro, Plato has Socrates talking to a fellow citizen named Eutifro on the nature of the good. Eutifro tells Socrates that what is good is that which is loved by the gods. Socrates then asks whether it is good because it is loved by the gods, or is it loved by the gods because it is good? If it is good because it is loved by the gods, then anything loved by the gods would be good. The torturing of a young child for pleasure would be good if only the gods named it so. Furthermore, there is no reason for the gods to choose goodness in something other than the torturing of a child for pleasure because there is nothing outside of what the gods like for even the gods to appeal to. On the other hand, if it is loved because the gods, uh, because it is good, then goodness exists independent of whatever it is that is loved by the gods. Even the gods have to ask what is good before they can determine what deserves their love and what does not. So we have not answered the question of what goodness is by appeal to what is loved by the gods. We have only said that whatever goodness is, the gods love it. The evolutionary ethicist goes into this debate with the theist, knowing this objection to divine command theories of ethics in most cases, and yet to totally ignores this same problem when he presents his own theory. When asked what is good, the evolutionary ethicist effectively answers what is good is, is what is loved by the genes. Against this, a 21st century Socrates can ask, is it loved by the genes because it is good, or is it good because it is loved by the genes? If it is good because it is loved by our genes, then anything that comes to be loved by the genes can become good. If humans, like lions, had a disposition to slaughter their, their stepchildren, or to behead their mates and eat them, or to attack neighboring tribes and tear their members to bits, all of which occurs in the natural kingdom, then these things would be good. We could not brag that humans evolved a disposition to be moral because morality would then be whatever humans evolved a disposition to do. If instead it is loved by our genes because it is good, then we have not yet answered the question of what goodness is. Unfortunately, an account of goodness is a prerequisite to making and defending this theory of value. How can we demonstrate or how can we attempt to falsify the thesis that what is good is loved by our genes if we have no account of what goodness is that is independent of what is loved by our genes? This in itself should be sufficient to destroy any evolutionary account of morality, just as the original argument should be sufficient to destroy any divine command account of morality. Then, the evolutionary ethicists will speak in terms of moral condemnation against the theist for their willful ignorance of such a foolproof objection to divine command theories of action, of ethics, I mean. In doing so, he asserts, at least implicitly, that he is too good of a person to do anything like what the theist is doing. 
simply ignoring an argument that is fatal to his position because he loves the position too much to consider objections. The evolutionary ethicist ends up being wrong here as well. Here too, he is mistaken. Here too, we find a way in which the divine command ethicist and the evolutionary ethicist have more in common than either would care to admit, so much that when the two debate each other on questions of morality, we really are not given much of a choice. So, okay, about the relationship between evolution and morality. I criticize atheists who debate theists on issues of morality without God, who assert that we have an evolved set of moral dispositions. And I answer that, just as Eutifero Dilemma provides a fatal blow to the divine command theories of ethics, it provides a similarly fatal blow to genetic command theories of ethics. Socrates questions to Eutifero, is it good because it is loved by the gods, or is it loved by the gods because it is good? forces the divine command theorists to either argue that anything loved by the gods is good no matter what it is or that there is a standard that even the gods must appeal to in determining what is to love and what not to love. The same question can be applied to evolutionary theories of ethics. Is it good because it is loved by the genes or is it loved by the genes because it is good? And it leads to the same dilemma. There is a relationship between evolution and morality. However, the evolutionary ethicist gets this relationship wrong, and their error is what leads to the Eutifero dilemma. Our desires have clearly been under the influence of evolutionary pressures. We are the descendants of those ancestors disposed to desire that which brought about genetic replication. Where a disposition to desire brought about a premature death or disinclined an individual to mate or to care for kin's offspring, any genetic influences to those dispositions ended up in the evolutionary garbage bin. So we have desires for sex, for certain kinds of food, for water, for an environment with a comfortable temperature and the like. However, at some point along the line, evolution gave us the capacity to acquire desires, not through genetic hardwiring, but through interaction with the environment. It was a very useful trait. If you have a square peg, you can only fit it into a square hole. There is only one environment that the peg will fit in. If the environment should change, the square peg loses its fit. On the other hand, if we had a peg that had the ability to modify its shape, then it does not matter what environment the peg finds itself in. It can adapt its shape to fit into that environment. This is the advantage of malleability. Even here, evolution will continue to have an influence. Evolution will work to fine-tune the types of lessons we learn given different types of environment. Evolution will tell us what we learn when we experience pain. How does a dog, for example, come to associate his punishment with the prior act of urinating on the carpet? Or how does the trained dolphin come to realize exactly which sets of actions result in his getting a fish? These examples of training illustrate another feature of malleable desires. If creature A's desires can be molded by his interaction with the environment, then creature B gains the power to influence which desires A gets simply by altering A's environment. B's own desires provide the motivating reason to mold A's desires. Specifically, given the fact that A will always act so as to fulfill the most and the strongest of A's own desires, B has reason to mold those desires so that the actions also, and at the same time, aim to fulfill, or at least fail to thwart, B's desires. So B has a reason to promote in A those desires that tend to fill other desires. At the same time, A has reason to promote in B those desires that tend to fulfill other desires. Each has the power to influence the desires of the other by manipulating the environment, by creating an environment in which each will tend to acquire those desires that tend to fulfill the desires of others, and to avoid those desires that tend to thwart the desires of others. So morality comes into the world. Morality is the institution of manipulating the environment using praise, condemnation, reward and punishment to promote those desires that tend to fulfill the desires of others and inhibit the desires that tend to thwart the desire of others. 
Morality itself is not an evolved disposition to favor or disfavor certain actions. Morality is a consequence of the fact that we evolved malleable desires. Thus, we evolved the capacity to influence the desire others acquire by altering the environment and that we have reason to promote desires that tend to fulfill other desires and inhibit desires that tend to thwart other desires.